okay, now there's opportunities to not only have the benefits that come out of a long-term care policy, the eight or ten thousand dollars a month, but also the premiums are, can be treated with as tax deductions, depending on the kind of business you have. And we're talking about sole proprietor, LLC, S corporation, and that the granddaddy of all the best one is the C corporation. Welcome to B2B Synergy, the Power Partners USA podcast, your exclusive guide to discovering the potential of B2B partnerships. I'm Alan Armijo, owner of Power Partners USA Business to Business Introduction and Referral Service. Our members are B2B professionals who team up to provide each other repeat referral business or collaboration. Today's episode dives into long-term care insurance and estate planning, specifically the intersection between a long-term care insurance broker and an estate planning attorney. I'm happy to shine a light on Power Partner USA members, Jim Better, owner of Essential Plans of Insurance, and Phil Shakurlian, owner of Bauer and Shakurlian Law. I am really glad to have both of you here together. I have our estate plan through Phil's law office and have received some great long-term care insurance advice from Jim. But one of the things I always feel is missing is having the professionals involved in these serious transactions be on the same page with me. At the same time, for instance, typically most people will talk with their insurance broker individually and then go and talk with their trust attorney and may miss out on important factors that affect both their policy and their trust. This podcast intention is to have that conversation together. So welcome to you two. Thanks for having me, John. Great. Thank you, Alan. We have a lot of information on both of you on our explain here on your account page. Um, so I just kind of want to dive into this intersection between your two professions, and uh, we'll have those links to all your information in the show notes. But to both of you, this question is to both of you, how do estate planning and long-term care insurance intersect, and why would an insurance broker and estate planning attorney collaborate on behalf of their clients? You can go first, Jim. Okay. Well, the size of the, a client's asset pool really determines a lot. People with few assets and with low income really are, they're going to end up accessing the state's Medicaid, Medicaid resource for their long-term care. On the other side, people who do have assets to protect and have income, they want to protect those assets. That, that's what wills and trusts are for, and that's what insurance plans do as well. So that in the event of a, one of the partners or one of the people in a marriage has a long-term care event. The assets they've been able to accumulate are going to be spent on nursing home care or home care. Rather, they'll go for their intended purposes, like protecting the person that you love. Absolutely. And what I do is not just estate planning. You know, there are attorneys out there that just do estate planning. We do wealth and legacy planning. And part of the legacy portion of that is making sure you have a legacy to leave behind. And if you don't have your retirement in order, your long-term care plan in order, potentially life insurance. You know, if you don't have all of that in place, then you may not have a legacy to leave behind and, and you may not even benefit from doing an estate plan. So that's where I can work with people like Jim. And if I have a client that may have a long-term care need in the future, they don't have the money to fund it. Like Jim was saying, they're not going to be going on Medi-Cal, then I can refer them to Jim and Jim can help them get that set up and we can include that in their estate plan. So Phil, do you have to understand the client's long-term healthcare needs in order to advise them and do effective strategies? Yeah, I need to know the basics of it just so I can figure out what type of, uh, I guess, care plan is going to be best for them. Is it going to be Medi-Cal? Is it going to be a paid care plan? Is it going to be just they have enough money to finance it? So I need to know enough to make that determination. As far as what the best long-term care plan is, that, that's when it goes to Jim's court and he needs all the details. And then to Jim, when do you bring up if a person has or needs a trust when discussing their long-term care needs? The reality is government statistics say that 70% of the population over 65 are going to have a need for a long-term care plan. And in a couple of relationships, the numbers, well, it's staggering, 91%, one of them is going to have a long-term care event. And so the need to prepare for that. It's pretty obvious that if it's 70% for a single person, 90% for somebody in a couple, you got to assume that it's going to be something that has to be planned for. Though it may or may not be insurance, maybe it's a government plan, maybe it's a military plan, but nevertheless, no estate plan is complete without at least some acknowledgement 
that uh, it could be a significant expense down the road and it has to be planned for. So, but wh when do you bring that up? Um, if a person needs a trust, like, cause there's a lot of different plans. When would you say is the appropriate time to ask or deal with the issue of a trust? Well, you know, it's a relationship building thing, Alan, isn't it? And Phil knows that too, getting to know people and, you know, at some point in the conversations and the getting to know you exercise, you know, a simple question about, you know, what is your plan for, um, your, the, the last quarter of your life or uh, what's your plan for funding your kid's education or, you know, you can weave it into a conversation and to get people to focus on the need for estate plans and legal documents, as well as financing plans. And I think, you know, I have the same thing. And when I talk about long-term care planning, it's not necessarily one set time in my conversation with the client either. It's, you know, when it naturally comes up based on the evolution of the conversation, it tends to be different for me as well. Yeah. Okay, good. So to both of you, how do you ensure effective communication and collaboration between you two and like in the case of a client? How do you, like, does confidential information come into it? Because you're both dealing in confidential information. Yeah, I mean, I would say, obviously, you know, making sure you are communicating, it helps to go to lunch. You know, Jim and I just recently went to lunch at the restaurant and had a great lunch. And, you know, that's a good opportunity to talk about clients we're collaborating on. As far as the confidentiality, in my case, you know, I have to ask the client, do I have permission to disclose the information you've given me freely with Jim or if I'm dealing with any other advisor? And as long as they say, yes, I can do that. If not, then I can't disclose anything. Yeah. Same with you, Jim, because you're dealing with medical information. Or... Yeah, all that private health information it has to be secure without permission to release. But the fact is that when Phil's doing an intake with a client or I'm doing an intake with a client, we deal holistically. Somebody comes to me and says, well, okay, I want one of these insurance policies for my long-term care. And my question is, okay, that's part of your project here. Do you have your legal documents set up? Well, no. Well, I'm going to refer you to a friend of mine who does this all the time. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to share what you told me that comes from the intake and what we call in this business, the fact finder. Okay. So Power Partners USA is about making introductions for that lead to repeat referral business or collaboration. What other professionals need to be brought into the process when an estate planner and insurance broker are collaborating on behalf of the client? You know, I think that it really depends on each client's particular circumstance. You know, if the client is elderly and has a lot of real estate, maybe one option for funding their retirement, funding their, their care could be to bring in a reverse mortgage guy like Tom DeLeo. If the client has some real estate that they want to sell, we could bring in somebody like Jeff Hakeem that can help them sell that to fund their care. Or if it's residential real estate, Valerie Condon could come in and help us out as well. Just to follow up with what Phil said, we're doing this and we try to introduce the, the caregiving part of the equation and introduce them to Arlene and see you know, what the, what home care looks like and what the cost of home care is, what support and care looks like and what does that cost. And then, you know, we call it senior living now, but just to be called nursing home care, you know, what that looks like in the continual. So thank you. You guys are kind of in the heart of, you know, the client's information, their finances, their health. Let's talk a little bit about understanding the client needs. Uh, to Phil, from your experience, how often do clients inquire about both estate planning and long-term care insurance simultaneously? Does that come up? I don't necessarily think that they ask about long-term care insurance in estate planning. But a lot of the times we do get calls where they're trying to figure out how to plan for their long-term care. They may not know about the insurance or, or maybe they're thinking Medi-Cal that actually comes up more often than anything as they're trying to see if they can get Medi-Cal. And so typically they, they're interested in figuring out the estate plan side so that they can qualify for Medi-Cal or long-term care or whatever it is that they need. But it's, it's probably, I don't know, maybe around a third of the time. Okay. And then Jim, like, do you, do you get involved or does it? come up in their long-term goals regarding asset protection or estate planning 
uh, even, you know, taxes are also a part of this. Do you ask questions that would provide insight into these things or do they just come up kind of like you said, like naturally? Well, you know, the, the, most clients need to be guided through the process. Michelle Phil sees that too. But people say, okay, I've got to prepare for, well, we used to call, we used to call them estate planning, but what it really is, is end of life planning. It's a euphemistically expressed that way because nobody wants to talk about end of life. <laughs> so, you know, in, in the process of having conversations of, about the subject of estate planning, as Phil's expressed, people are concerned about the cost and the default is, okay, well, I'll go on Medi-Cal, which, you know, the, the people who have assets and can afford to have insurance protection will be a lot better off than those who opt for the state health care plan. And with people that do have assets, do you, and, and, you know, because they're, they're aware of long-term care insurance, would you say that they're educated on these things? Just in terms of the fact that somebody who's coming for long-term care insurance, and after you, you've discussed some things with them, because long-term care is, is an insurance policy, are they kind of educated or are you having to educate them on both long-term care and then you see that they have a need for estate planning or is that estate planning already taken care of in a lot of cases? In most cases, they've already started the legal process or have completed the legal process and now are wondering about the, I want to know about the funding part. And that's where we get involved. And so the needs analysis of, okay, where's the money going to come from if you need $100,000 a year for a, a three-year Alzheimer's condition or a stroke or whatever it may be, where's that money going to come from? And that usually gets people to glaze over pretty quickly. So, um, so the estate plan or where, where's that money going to come from? Well, well, I mean, Phil kind of said like they might have to sell off some assets and things like that. Is 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 that kind of connected with your role in the, in the interaction between you and Phil, or is that something different? No, it's all part of the process. I think every still involved in where does the money come from? As Phil suggested, maybe it's a reverse mortgage. That's an option. Or maybe you sell out some properties or other assets, or you say, okay, I get deep enough pockets and I'll just pay for it myself. Or you look at having somebody else pay those bills, like an insurance company. Okay. So let's get a little deeper into the financial and legal considerations here. Phil, mm -hmm. how do long-term costs impact estate planning and what strategies can help mitigate these expenses? Yeah. Good question. I mean, um, the, the cost can be, you know, a whole wide range of costs. The younger you are, when you start your long-term care insurance, the cheaper it is. But for people that are, you know, that didn't get it done as early as possible, it could be, the price could be really astronomical. And again, you know, back to what we both said is they may have to do a reverse mortgage or sell property to fund it, but also there should be an analysis of, you know, would they be better off just dealing with the Medi-Cal care that the state provides, which isn't as good and maybe paying a little extra for things that they need extra for. Uh, it's all part of the process. Okay. And, um, Jim, would you maybe add to that uh, regarding what I believe people don't know about with long-term care is the taxes and deductions that are available to them, especially if they own a business, would that help in kind of the um, understanding of the whole picture of, it, of why you have long-term care? Well, you know, first there has to be a, 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 people have to, you know, that we have needs and wants and wants always take um, precedence over needs. And so when somebody recognizes that, okay, I really want to protect my family against going through all my money on a nursing home expense, how do I pay for it? If I have a business, okay, now, now, now there's opportunities to not only have the benefits that come out of a long-term care policy, the eight or $10,000 a month, but also the premiums, um, I can be treated with, as tax deductions, depending on the kind of business you have. And we're talking about sole proprietor, LLC, S corporation, and that the granddaddy of all, the best one is the C corporation, because then an employer can extend the benefits to other people on a discriminatory basis. So that he doesn't have to offer to all of his employees, but he gets a hundred percent deduction for the long-term care costs of those policies. 
Okay. So, so if you get it right here, you know, you get the benefits tax free and you get a deduction on the, on the premiums. If you want to have this coverage, uh, now it becomes a lot easier decision when you say the government is going to help you pay for this. Okay. And add to that, if the business owner is considering long-term care insurance for themselves, they can offer it to a select class of their employees. They can offer to pay 50% for their employees, but they can also say that a different class such as CEOs and executives get a hundred percent paid for it. So now theirs becomes tax deductible as well as what they're providing for their employees. So it could be a good tax saving strategy for a business owner as well. Yeah, if there's no, no ERISA qualifying plans, it's going to be discriminatory. What does that mean, Jim? Well, things like health insurance and disability insurance, if the employer pays for it, there has to be a provision where everybody has access to it with long-term care insurance. It's not that way. It can be, you can select a, as Phil just suggested, a couple of people within the organization where you offer to, you don't have to offer to everybody. If that person leaves the company, can they take that policy with them? Because the company's no longer going to pay for it, right? Well, the reality is that all of these policies, even if they're bought through a corporation, are individual policies. So the, the employer is paying for it, but the employee leaves and now he breaks the gang clubs and go on his own. Now he or she would then assume the cost of the policy. Uh, that, that can also be contracted for when it's being set up as well, that the owner can say that the client has to buy, you know, they already paid benefits if they haven't worked there for a certain amount of time, like a vesting period, you know, there are different provisions it, that can be contracted for it you know, as well. So Phil, in these cases, like when you're writing a trust, I know you can write a lot of things into a trust. Is long-term insurance one of them that can be written in some way? It can be. You typically wouldn't put it into a basic revocable trust because long-term care insurance expires upon your death. But if a client had an irrevocable trust for their benefit, then absolutely we would write it in there. The reason for that is what? To make sure that it's protected, you know, they have an irrevocable trust for asset protection purposes to make sure that the income or the money coming out of the policy goes into the trust where it stays protected and can be used for their benefit. Okay. And then Jim, any other specific legal considerations that the client should be aware of when purchasing long-term insurance? Well, it's pretty straightforward. The policy should be owned either jointly by a couple of two people on the plan or individually and having a second insured on the plan. But they should, it's most often to have done outside of any trust or other legal agreement and kept separate. Okay. And then Phil, are there any legal considerations that insurance brokers should keep in mind when assisting clients when planning their long-term needs? The legal considerations, I guess, you know, just making sure that they don't have any asset protection concerns, I guess, estate tax, you know, if the client's really high net worth, making sure that the that maybe the long-term care isn't the best idea because maybe they'd want to spend down some of their money to reduce the estate tax liability to their heirs. And then the asset protection, like I spoke of earlier, if they needed to protect the, the income coming from long-term care. So that's saying that, is that a legal consideration? Yeah, that would be the legal side of it. You know, when Jim would set up a policy for the client, he would, him and I would discuss and I would say, Hey, you know, this client is, you know, they're worth $40 million. Maybe the, you know, the long-term care might not be the best option for them. You know, is there something else or however it goes, but that was a conversation we would have definitely beforehand. Okay. All right. So, and this is what we were saying of like, what, what are some, to both of you, what are some of the common challenges that clients face when coordinating their estate plans with long-term care insurance transactions? Well, in my experience, if I'm writing the case, working with the client, you know, as we suggested earlier, we look at it on a holistic basis, but you know, then it may be somebody else who's not a specialist in the business and they say, okay, I'll write your long-term care policy and good luck without recognizing the fact that the job isn't done until the legal documents are also completed. It's a matter of the, who the, what's the professionalism of the person who's doing the long-term care contracting. And also whether or not they're insurable. You know, I don't necessarily know if they're insurable. So when I send them to Jim, if he comes back and says, Hey, they're not insurable, then we got to go back to the drawing boards. Yeah. 
Jim. Are estate planners, in your experience, knowledgeable about these tax issues? How can estate planners inform their clients about tax consequences or benefits of having long-term care insurance as part of their estate plan? The long-term care insurance is heavily nuanced. And I find that many financial planners, especially, and some estate planners, just aren't aware of the tax implications of long-term care insurance. They generally know that the benefits are tax-free, but the ability to be able to have the premiums tax deductible is and sometimes there's a knowledge gap in that. And it's, it's unfortunate because, you know, if they go somewhere else and that they're not aware that the premiums are deductible, there's a lot more that comes out of pocket. Do you have anything to add to that, Phil? Yeah. I mean, I think that in general, a lot of financial professionals try to stay away from tax, you know, even estate planners, most of them don't know anything on the tax side. So you really need to make sure that you have your tax professional, CPA, tax attorney, whatever, getting involved in that. And that's, you know, that's what benefits we add is that we're tax attorneys and CPAs here. Good. Right. This question is not going to come up in your do it yourself estate plan. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about multi generational planning uh, to both of you. How, how do you approach estate planning and long term care insurance advice when working with clients who are considering passing on assets to multiple generations or beneficiaries? Jim, you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You know, generational wealth is is always a consideration that we're looking at. You know, usually using a a legacy trust, lifetime benefit trust, dynasty trust, whatever you want to call it, is one way to pass any assets on. When it comes to long-term care insurance, that's, again, that's for the individual who it covers. So when they die, there's nothing really to pass on there. So we typically don't include that in our estate plans. The basic estate plans, like I said, for preparing for death. Yeah. And that's generally true and, um, with the, with the so-called hybrid policies. Um, however, there is a death benefit that's that's that comes with those contracts if they don't use the long-term care part. And the, the fact is in Phil knows this, uh, the cost of long-term care depletes the value of the estate dollar for dollar. Uh, Jim, maybe you might explain what a hybrid policy is. What, good what point. A hybrid policy is really a combination of a long-term care policy and a life insurance policy. And it guarantees that the contract is going to pay out. It's either going to cover the long-term care expenses, or if there's no long-term care expenses, then it pays out like a life insurance policy. And, and generally those policies also come with a cash value, which isn't, so it should not ever be part of the consideration, but nevertheless, it's an added feature to the hybrid policies and, you know, the assets of a, uh, the cost of long-term care depletes assets dollar for dollar. And what insurance does, it pays those expenses so that the estate isn't, isn't going to be depleted by whatever amount that insurance policy is going to cover. So are you both kind of in a, on the same page or in agreement on the fact that somebody has, the individual has the long-term care insurance, the beneficiaries say that that money is going into that insurance. How do you see this in the long run or the short run? Or how are people, see, how are clients seeing this? Is this a long, good thing in the long run for assets or beneficiaries? Or is it, you know, what, what are they looking at here? You know, the, the, the days that I, when a, a family comes to me or the adult children come to me and, and they'll say, look, mom and dad are getting older, they're healthy now, but they want to talk about buying insurance policy on their, for their long-term care. I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is manner from heaven. People just don't react this way very often. But the fact is that if the adult children are, are going to pay for the long-term care expense, what have they done? They preserved the assets that are going to be left over from the parents. You know, my personal experience before I get into this business, why I get into this business is that my mother burned through several hundred thousand dollars of long-term care expenses. That was my inheritance. You know, if this was the experience now with my family and my parents were still insurable, you know, I wouldn't have any question about, okay, I know they've got some money and they want to pass it on to me. So get my brother and sister together and we'll share the premium cost. It works for everybody. Yeah. And that, that's a good point. You know, the long-term care insurance doesn't just affect the client. It affects everybody around the client. If you get to the point where you need constant care, you have some form of dementia and you can't care for yourself at all, your kids or siblings or family members have to really step up and take time out of their lives to help. And if there's some 
financial way to provide the help to the kids and the family members, it makes life a lot easier. It sure does. It takes the burden off of the family. And you know, long-term care insurance, it, it is a, it's a family, family issue. It's a family matter. Absolutely. Okay. Now, most people who buy it, what I hear from people is when they ask them the question, okay, what motivated you to do this? I don't want to be a burden to my children. And so that's why they, they, they will contract this and put the financial plan in place to cover those expenses. So they, their children, their, their adult sons aren't going to have to come and give them a bath or feed them. You know, they have somebody else to have a professional come in and take care of that stuff. Okay. We're coming down to here at the end here. Um, can you both share some common misconceptions or overlooked aspects that clients should be aware of? Okay. The number one myth is that the Medicare is going to cover their long-term care expenses. Medicare is for medical expenses, not for custodial care. That's what long-term care is. Many people believe that it's going to be taken care of by the Medicare plan, but that's not true. It isn't happening. Another misconception is that their children will become the caregivers. Well, you know, if they were living in different states, it becomes very difficult and disrupts the lives of the, of the, uh, of the children when they have to become caregivers. I don't, it's just not going to happen. And then there's always the excuse that, okay, I'm going to be happy, healthy and dead on the same day. And I won't be needing this. Um, and so um, just move on from the subject. If somebody says, I'm going to use the AK-47, the uh, exit route or the Kevorkian rider and uh, take care of it that way. Well, you, know, you better hope that you don't have a cognitive impairment that <laughs> causes you to forget that this is what you're playing. <laughs> and I think I want to add to that, that most people say, okay, well, Medicare is medical expenses doesn't cover long-term care, but Medi-Cal can help me with that. Well, first off, you got to qualify for Medi-Cal. Not everybody qualifies for it. And second off, this is a free government program. Just like all other free government programs, it's not going to be the best care. There's a lot of people waiting for care through the Medi-Cal system. So if you really want to have the best care, you're going to have to provide it for yourself and not rely on the government to do that. Okay. And those notes, that, that bubble of people who are going to be on Medi-Cal is about to explode. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the government is, you know, there, a lot of state governments are looking at ways to create financing plans for the big bubble of people who says, I'll just go on the state plan, even though they might be able to afford an insurance policy that pops up to the Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California. What Jim was just referring to why it's going to explode is because up until two years ago to qualify for Medi-Cal, you could only have assets of $2,000 qualifying assets. You could have things like your house and your car ex exempted, but your qualifying assets had to be 2000 or less. As of January 1st of this year, you could be a billionaire and qualify for Medi-Cal. The only thing that you have to show is that you have low income, but you could have a billion dollars of assets and very low income and still qualify. So a lot of people are going to be going on Medi-Cal. Is that 2000 a month you're saying? So that was your total assets that you have at any given time. $2,000? Yes. You had to have less than $2,000 of assets. How does somebody have less than $2,000 of assets? You'd be surprised. There's a lot of people. Well, they, 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 your house and your car and things like that are exempted. Like necessities are exempted. But like wouldn't social security and all that count toward that 2000 Well, as if you didn't spend it on bills, absolutely. If it stayed deposited in your bank account. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. now advice for listeners, give me one takeaway from this intersection between estate planning and long-term care insurance from each of you. What, what's the big takeaway from this conversation? Go for it, Jim. Better planning makes better endings. Yeah. I mean, I agree. And I would add to that pl planning far enough in advance, the earlier you do the planning, the cheaper it is, the more benefit you're going to get out of it. It's just, you know, it's not on most people's minds. I'm not going to die or be disabled until, you know, far in the future. And today I got to worry about taking my kids to the doctors or whatever the case may be. But again, the earlier you do it, the cheaper and more beneficial it is to do it. Okay. Well, thanks for the dark humor. Appreciate that. <laughs> my favorite type of humor. And uh, like I said, both of you have a lot of short videos about your services and yourself, your own words on our 
and you're explained here account page. Both of you have podcast information from previous podcasts. So we have a ton of content on you. We're promoting it on social media, but we're looking here to promote you in this manner as well, just to show people how Power Partners works in making these connections and how our partners are working together for repeat referral business because you guys share a client, right? In some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. No, we're, they're in the, in the same lane. I think it's important to know that Jim and I are both in the business of educating people and we both offer free consultations to make sure that people understand what they need before they're you know signing up for anything. Yeah, you're right. 90% of what we do is uh, educating. Right. And we, we're happy to be a conduit of that information as well for you. So um, thanks again. I look forward to your continued participation in Power Partners USA. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you.